Chapter Nine: Attack by Keyboard. In July 2013, amid the Syrian civil war, while shells periodically showered on northern Israel, while Iran continued its production of nuclear material, while the political unrest in Egypt allowed Hamas to arm itself, Israel's top two military leaders found their way to a nondescript building hidden by trees in central Israel. The only armed soldiers in the area were the guards at the gates and doors of the complex. For the first time in Israel's history, Chief of Staff General Benny Gantz, Israel's highest-ranking officer, and Minister of Defense Moshe Bogiyalon, former Chief of Staff, attended a special ceremony for the men and women in a unit known inside Israel as 8200. In most armies, it isn't an everyday event for the top brass to visit a facility where minds are more important than brawn, where keystrokes are as important as firing weapons on the battlefield. Unit 8200 is a fairly large but elite group of soldiers who work on computers all day. They can hack into just about any military network in the world. It is rumored that Unit 8200 can tap into electronic systems of enemies far and near, turn off power plants, radar stations, and the electronic capabilities of enemies and allies alike. Unit 8200 has become just as important to Israel as the men in tanks and the pilots who fly F-16s. One source familiar with Israeli military operations said, "8200 is now involved in just about everything we do." The exact reasons for General Gantz and Yarlon's congratulations to 8200 remains classified, but it's clear the unit has done something particularly significant. When General Gantz addressed the unit, he focused specifically on its covert role in intelligence. Intelligence transmitted in real time enables the IDF to create a clear and accurate picture at all times and gives impetus for sharp and fast action, which proves powerful on the battlefield. In his remarks, the defense minister added, "Your ability to identify threats in a timely manner leads to prevention. This unit is an example of the proper way to deal with frequent changes in the technological world around us. New threats create new arenas." While scores of Israel's top high school computer students are recruited for 8200 each year, it is Talpiot graduates who play an outsized role in commanding and creating programs for this unit. Among the responsibilities of Unit 8200 is the operation of a massive listening and signal intelligence gathering facility capable of intercepting information all over the world. While 8200's capabilities are global, one of its main responsibilities includes listening in on what is happening not far from Israel's borders, in Gaza and inside the disputed territories in the West Bank. The unit has been credited with foiling scores of terrorist attacks and for helping Israeli security forces make preemptive arrests. Reports still unconfirmed by Israel say that in September 2007, eight Israeli jets took off from a Negev airbase. Their mission: destroy a Syrian nuclear reactor that was under construction in the eastern part of the country, not far from the Iraqi border. The jets were able to straddle the borders of several countries, including Turkey, in order to confuse radar systems. Reports from outside of Israel say that Unit 8200 also played a role for, by breaking into Syria's radar defenses and limiting its ability to see the incoming Israeli planes. The jets successfully fired their missiles and dropped their bombs before safely returning to base in Israel. Soon after, reports from outside of Israel gave programmers at 8200 credit for scoring another major victory, this time against Iran's nuclear program. They had been asked by the prime minister's office, reportedly in cooperation with the Mossad, to develop some sort of a virus designed to infect, disrupt, and spy on computer workstations in Iran that were being used to work on the Islamic Republic's nuclear program. Their answer: Stuxnet. Stuxnet is a computer worm that was used to infect computers in Iran and was also used to give outsiders control of Iran's centrifuges, or at least to cause Iran to lose control of those centrifuges as they purified nuclear material to a level used in bombs and/or missiles. The United States also reportedly played a major role in Stuxnet, and it is congruent with U.S. strategy to disrupt and delay Iran's nuclear ambitions without physically attacking nuclear plants. Former Mossad chief Meir Dagan was asked about Stuxnet during a 60 Minutes interview in 2012. It would have been treasonous for him to formally comment about Israel's role in such an action, but he smiled widely, prompting many to feel that was confirmation enough. Since nobody has claimed credit, it's impossible to judge whether Stuxnet was truly a success. 
While it did at least slow down Iran's nuclear program, the program may have been designed to inflict more damage or to spy on the program over a longer term, so its overall success has to be questioned. Stuxnet wasn't the only attack launched on computers inside of Iran's nuclear facilities. A virus called ACDC struck Iran's Natanz and Fordor nuclear facilities in the spring of 2012. One victim inside Iran with knowledge of the malware was quoted on an internet message board saying there was also some music playing randomly on several of the workstations during the middle of the night with the volume maxed out. I believe it was playing Thunderstruck by ACDC. A UPI story on the incident said the message could not be verified, but it was believed to have come from workers at the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran. Ophir Kraoz, whom we first met in Chapter 5, had already moved on from the army well before Iran's computers were infected with this high-end spyware. But well before the Stuxnet computer attack program was launched, Kra Oz of Talpiot's 13th class played a big role in Unit 8200. While in Talpiot, Kra Oz was eager to learn everything about the IDF that he could. He took full advantage of Talpiot's unit-to-unit -unit field trips, learning about the artillery, the armed corps, the navy, Israel's space agency, combat troops, fighter jets, radar and weapons firing systems. But his heart was always in technology. After graduating from Talpiot's academic program, Kra Oz moved on to 8200, working on developing software that retrieved data stored in the Israeli military machine's computer servers. He described it as a Google-type search engine for the army. It mined vast amounts of information for intelligence agencies and other branches of the military with specially crafted algorithms. The system could find very specific information very quickly and it was designed so that many people with many backgrounds could quickly understand how to use it. Kra Oz started as a programmer in 8200, then became a team leader and later one of the youngest section heads in the elite unit's celebrated history. Later in his career, in discussing his experience with venture capitalists, Kra Oz pointed out that 8200 was a large unit but it operated like a series of small startups with different teams working quickly on different projects, although always in touch and in coordination with each other. While the rigorous Talpiot program helped prepare him for 8200, the pressure was still intense. In 8200, the military is physically very close to you, is very demanding and always has strong opinions about a project. We might be given days to do what we'd been given a year to do in civilian life. If we lost information, it could be critical. Someone's life could be in danger. If you know that this guy is carrying a Qassam rocket and is on his way to fire, that's pretty serious. And I was able to help come up with programs that allowed the military to defend against those kinds of threats. My time in the army also taught me a valuable lesson I'd need later in civilian life. You have to delegate. There's no way to satisfy a military client because the problem is endless. You're constantly gathering information and insights from all over the world in many different languages in real time with limited resources. On the other hand, they had no financial string to pull as there is in the corporate world. Payments can be denied in civilian life. In the army, the worst they could do was yell at me and tell me they were not happy. A good number of other Talpiot graduates participated in vital intelligence activities as well. Born in Argentina, Adam Kariv often felt like an outsider after his family moved to Israel, lacking many of the connections and networks other families had. He was convinced that he would never be able to be successful as Israel seemed to be a place where connections are vital. When he saw a TV report about Talpiot, it clicked. This is where he wanted to go. Adam didn't think he'd get in, but he got through the difficult tests and became part of the 18th class of Talpiot in 1997. After graduating, he was sent immediately to a technology unit of the Israel Intelligence Corps. He spent the next nine years working as a software engineer and then a unit leader. Everything he worked on remains highly classified, but it was his job to come up with new ways for the army to monitor events going on around Israel and to track people Israel needed to watch, from high-ranking officials to terrorists possibly planning attacks. The pay he received came to about 400 shekels a month, that's about $125. Compare that to the 30 or 40,000 shekels a month you'd get in the private sector, Kariv laughs. But you do the work to the best of your abilities because if you don't get something done, it could make a big difference in the life of someone, maybe a fellow soldier on the front line trying to protect you and your family. That's a very big responsibility and every day I did everything I could to do my best. Every keystroke meant something. 
It takes a while before it sinks in that your work could mean life or death. And even if it isn't life and death every minute, even in those times when it is less immediate and less critical, it is still very important. Another Talpiot drafted into military intelligence was Hagai Skolnikov. I went to a branch that is top-heavy with great math and science people, he recalls. It is a small place where mathematicians are needed. It was a shock to get there. There's a lot to learn and absorb. It's an amazing group of people. I worked on data analysis and algorithms. My unit had a very tight and specific domain which had been developed for several years. In certain parts of Israeli intelligence it is very well known, but it is not the kind of thing that gets much outside attention, and that's by design. Our base is north of Tel Aviv, and it houses many similar units that have almost no connection to one another, as we're not always supposed to know what the other units are doing. Skolnikov is very proud of what he did in that unit, but he can't share everything, saying, We're all quite good at talking about what we did without telling you anything we can't. We know how to work around the details. He continues, No two projects were the same. It's very exciting. It's not like working for some client somewhere. You're doing something for your country, and you have an immediate, sometimes very clear impact on security and in the success of Israel's military. They threw a lot of important things at us. I was involved for 10 years with problems that were generally considered unsolvable. We solved a good number of unsolvable things. Remember, in Talpiot they teach that nothing is impossible. They didn't quite mean it because of course some things are impossible, but they trained us to think that way. If you think differently about the question or find the loophole, you can move the unsolvable forward. Uri Bakai also did his post-Talpiot service in an elite intelligence unit that served as a main nerve center for the IDF. He came into the program as a software expert. Although his role was very important to Israel's intelligence gathering machine, he was never given the full picture of what his work was used for. It remains classified. Barak Peleg of the 21st Talpiot class of 1999 went into signal processing. He was tasked with developing software to track radar, radio, computer and other communication footprints left behind by people of deep interest to the IDF. That includes armies throughout the Middle East and terrorist organizations including Hamas, Islamic Jihad and Hezbollah. All of them are becoming more sophisticated in how they use electronics and how they communicate with each other and with the governments that help them financially and with training. The list is long and includes Iran, Syria, Lebanon and many other Middle Eastern countries with close ties to terrorism. He explains, signal processing would be obtaining the signal digitalizing it, manipulating it to handle whatever happened to it. If it's a transmission, how the medium affected it and cope with what the medium did to it. This is for incoming and outgoing signals. The data would then be analyzed and then analyzed more in depth by Army Intelligence, Amman. It could really give them a window into what was happening in places well beyond our borders. Looking back on his Talpiot experience, Peleg conjectures, the most important thing about Talpiot, which many graduates don't think about and the public doesn't know, is that they make us fearless. It becomes very hard to scare you. You can tackle anything. In 2010, the task of tackling the unknown was given to General Yitzhak ben Israel, who formerly had been head of Mafat and a Talpiot lecturer. By then it was crystal clear that battles were being fought between countries online and that online supremacy would be a key ingredient to any future military campaign. China and the US were already fighting battles online. China had been accused of breaking into the computer networks of American companies and stealing information, even snooping on highly classified military information. Iran was also becoming more and more adept at cyber warfare and espionage through computers. Computer hackers in the Islamic Republic broke into Saudi Aramco's computer system, wiping out key information. Computer users in Iran have also been accused of attacking the financial system in the United States and crashing or slowing the websites of American banks. Countries must be able to protect their financial and physical infrastructure from enemies using computers thousands of miles away. General Ben Israel was appointed cyber advisor to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. One of Ben Israel's first moves was to create the Israel National Cyber Bureau on August 7, 2011 and appoint Talpiot graduate Eviatar Matania as its head. The goal of the INCB is to provide the Prime Minister with advice on managing this new and crucial front where both defense and offense are needed and to carry out missions. 
It is also expected to provide for the continuation of life as normal if the country comes under some sort of cyber attack, just like the Home Front Command is expected to do if and when Israel comes under physical attack. Another reason for the creation of the INCB was to expand Israel's lead over its enemies in the Middle East in the field of cyber warfare. As Israel's enemies grow their own cyber capabilities, the INCB was created to maintain that qualitative edge so critical to Israel's survival. Matania was invited to a meeting of the Israeli cabinet in November 2011, shortly after he became head of the Israel National Cyber Bureau. He told members of the government that cyber attacks are a broad threat to human society. While this is a challenge to the state, it is also an economic opportunity. The more we invest in academia and industry, the greater the return we will receive from both economic and security perspectives. Prime Minister Netanyahu followed Matania, explaining to the cabinet, Israel is a significant force in cyberspace. Just as we develop the unprecedented Iron Dome system that successfully intercepts missiles, we are developing a kind of digital Iron Dome in order to defend the country against attacks on our computer systems. The INCB is designed, first and foremost, to organize defensive capabilities based on cooperation between three elements, security capability, the business community, and the academic world. In 2012, Matania built a national cyber situation room to assess threats launched against Israel from foreign computers. Its goal is to have one central place where Israel's political leaders can go to see the full picture of what is threatening the state and what's being done to protect it. It is also a place where high-ranking military officers, government officials and business leaders can come to share information. The Israel National Cyber Bureau works closely with Israeli software companies to protect the nation from the growing threat of hackers working for hostile governments, terrorist groups or working as lone wolves on the internet. Another of Matania's initial goals was to create clear and direct links between the Bureau and computer scientists working in Israeli industry and at top Israeli universities including Hebrew University, Tel Aviv University and the Technion. This multi-system, multi-organized kind of project management is an approach Matania developed in Talpiot, where sharing information and cooperation are highly prized. He also instituted awarding funds to promising mines and programs in the cyber field, in 2013, $20 million was set aside for individuals, companies and universities with good ideas in the field of cybersecurity. Eviatar Matania has wisely used the Bureau to help advertise Israel's prowess in global cybersecurity, creating thousands of jobs and billions of shekels in revenue. It also serves as an arm that cooperates with friendly foreign countries and shares information about threats and enemies, much like Israel's intelligence agencies. The INCB also serves as a gateway for foreign investment in Israel's technology sector. In late 2012, the INCB took a new step, establishing a research and development arm. It was similar to the step the Ministry of Defense took decades before, investing heavily in research and development for Israeli-made weapons. The research and development arm of the INCB is known by the acronym MASAD. It deals with cyber projects for both the military and private sectors. Israeli startup companies, programmers in established software companies, university professors, members of the government and the defense establishment have all been asked to contribute to the effort. As Massad was announced, Mafat director of Fir Shoham, another Talpiot graduate, issued a statement saying, The plan is an additional layer in the Ministry of Defense's preparations to meet the cyber challenges currently facing the State of Israel. The Mossad plan is expected to link technological vectors based on the know-how and capabilities of companies and academia with common defense and civilian needs. Today, through INCB and Mossad, Israel is always at the cutting edge of cyber development. Warfare has changed considerably since 1948 War of Independence, when a clumsy, inaccurate cannon known as the Davidka could turn the tide in battle simply by scaring the enemy with its piercing shriek and massive explosive boom. Its clever inventor discerned that when an army is outnumbered, ingenuity could compensate for lesser troops. In that respect, the creative and searching minds of Unit 8200 and the INCB continue to uphold Israel's resourceful military legacy. Fast action, which proves powerful on the battlefield. In his remarks, the Defence Minister added, Your ability to identify threats in a timely manner leads to prevention.
This unit is an example of the proper way to deal with frequent changes in the technological world around us. New threats create new arenas. While scores of Israel's top high school computer students are recruited for 8200 each year, it is Talpiot graduates who play an outsized role in commanding and creating programs for this unit. Among the responsibilities of Unit 8200 is the operation of a massive listening and signal intelligence gathering facility capable of intercepting information all over the world. Chapter 9 Attack by Keyboard In July 2013, amid the Syrian civil war, while shells periodically showered on northern Israel, while Iran continued its production of nuclear material, while the political unrest in Egypt allowed Hamas to arm itself, Israel's top two military leaders found their way to a nondescript building hidden by trees in central Israel. The only armed soldiers in the area were the guards at the gates and doors of the complex. For the first time in Israel's history, Chief of Staff General Benny Gantz, Israel's highest ranking officer, and Minister of Unit 8200 has become just as important to Israel as the men in tanks and the pilots who fly F-16s. One source familiar with Israeli military operations said, 8200 is now involved in just about everything we do. The exact reasons for General Gantz and Yaalon's congratulations to 8200 remains classified, but it's clear the unit has done something particularly significant. When General Gantz addressed the unit, he focused specifically on its covert role in intelligence. Intelligence transmitted in real time enables the IDF to create a clear and accurate picture at all times and gives impetus for sharp and f While 8200's capabilities are global, one of its main responsibilities includes listening in on what is happening not far from Israel's borders, in Gaza and inside the disputed territories in the West Bank. The unit has been credited with foiling scores of terrorist attacks and for helping Israeli security forces make preemptive arrests. Reports still unconfirmed by Israel say that in September 2007, eight Israeli jets took off from a Negev airbase. Their mission? Destroy a Syrian nuclear reactor that was under construction in the eastern part of the country not far from the Iraqi border. The jets were able to straddle the borders of several countries in defense Moshe Bogiyalon, a former chief of staff, attended a special ceremony for the men and women in a unit known inside Israel as 8200. In most armies, it isn't an everyday event for the top brass to visit a facility where mines are more important than brawn, where keystrokes are as important as firing weapons on the battlefield. Unit 8200 is a fairly large but elite group of soldiers who work on computers all day. They can hack into just about any military network in the world. It is rumoured that Unit 8200 can tap into electronic systems of enemies far and near, turn off power plants, radar stations and the electronic capabilities of enemies and allies alike.